Welcome, everybody. All, uh, we have at least uh, 200 call-ins right now and well over 300 people that have uh, participating from 20 states and Canada and God knows where. It's wonderful to have uh, everybody join us here at Congregation Toradell. Uh, for those I don't know, because in this case, there's plenty I don't know. My name is Aaron Schoenbrunn. I have the privilege of being the rabbi of this uh, congregation um, and um, of just welcoming everybody. I hope everybody had a meaningful uh, holiday experience that I'm sure was different for most of us than all others. And I want to just um, welcome our author, Ron Balson, who's here with us. We're delighted uh, to have you with us. I want to uh, thank Allison, thank uh, Sue, the entire committee who, uh, I don't want to start naming everybody because I'll miss somebody, uh, but you don't just uh, put all of this together without any effort. So thank them for all their efforts. And of course, um, Pam Cardulo in our office, um, um, our executive director and everybody for really uh, putting together such a wonderful program tonight. Um, as you did not come to hear me, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Allison Block, who is going to uh, introduce our speaker for this evening. Thanks, Rabbi. Um, first of all, I want to thank everyone who is here tonight. I especially would like to thank the committee who worked so hard in selecting our books for the coming year and also working on this program. I would also especially like to thank Pam Cardulo and our office staff in the midst of all the hard work for the High Holy Days. Pam continued to catch every mistake I made, getting ready for Meet the Author and getting everything ready to go. So I would like to thank them. I would also like to thank the Women's League for Conservative Judaism and Change, two organizations which helped us to promote this event. And also any of you who are on the event tonight from another synagogue other than our home synagogue, Congregation Toradel, I'd like to thank you for joining us and for sharing the event with your friends and family. We know that um, it's not as exciting to be virtual, but we're delighted to have Ron in our virtual living room tonight. Um, so I'm gonna, without further ado, introduce Ron. Ron Balson is a trial attorney an educator and a novelist. I have trouble sticking with one profession. I have no idea how he does three at a time. I think he's going to tell us. In May of this year, we were set to have Ron speak at an in-person event for his novel, The Girl from Berlin. As all of you know, COVID-19 happened and Ron and I talked, we went back and forth and we said, okay, by October, this will be over and you'll come in October. We picked a date. We were all excited. Lo and behold, here we are still doing virtual events. And in the meantime, in September, Ron had another book come out. So tonight we're going to be talking about The Girl from Berlin, as well as Eli's Promise, his new book. Ron has received a lot of awards. I'm not going to tell you all of them, but The Girl from Berlin got the National Jewish Book Council Award for 2019, he also received, he was also selected for adults for the Illinois Reads program. Um, he was a 2014 finalist for the Harper Lee Award for legal fiction. And he was honored at the Chicago Library Carl Sandburg Literary Award dinner for his work. Many of you, if you haven't read all of his books, certainly remember his first book, Once We Were Brothers, which was an international bestseller. Since then, he has written Carolina's Twins, The Trust, Saving Sophie, and the two books that I just mentioned to you. Ron lives in Chicago, and as I said, we're delighted to have him with us tonight. Before I turn the program over to him, we are taking questions tonight when Ron is through speaking. Please put your questions in the chat at the bottom of the screen, if you move your arrow to the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little sort of text balloon that says chat. You can type your questions in. Susan Sferris, Pam Cardulo, the rabbi and I are gonna be watching the chat for your questions. You can put them in throughout Ron's talk so that you don't forget them. And then when he's done, we'll be going through the questions and Ron has graciously agreed to stay as long as we want him to, to answer them. Please mute yourself. If you've just come in and you didn't come in muted, please mute yourself. And one other announcement, Ron has also said he'll be happy to sign book plates. Um, Neil Weitzenkorn is going to put his email address in the chat. 
Neil, have you done that yet? And you can send your name and address to Neil's email address, which he will put in the chat. If you are interested in having a signed book plate for your hardcover or soft cover book. So without further ado, I'd like to turn the program over to Ronald Lawson. Oh, thank you. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Uh, thanks to Alice and thanks to Pam. Thanks to Rabbi and all the people that worked so hard to put this together. This is a huge event, folks, and to put together so many people in a Zoom event, um, I don't know how it's done. To tell you the truth, I don't know how. It, uh, it takes a great, great deal of organizing skill to do that. And I'm, and I'm very honored and, and appreciative of the uh, invitation to be here and to talk to all of you. And, and I, it just blows me away that there are so many people that want to come hear me talk. And it's, uh, I was saying before, I wish we could do it in person. I wish I could walk back and forth across the stage and point at you and talk to you and ask you a question and laugh with you. And, and, um, and right now all I can do is look at a computer screen just like you. And, and it's tough, but we, we do the best we can and it's wonderful that we can do, we can do this. So, uh, let me tell you tonight how the discussion will go and uh, what I plan on doing. And, and at the end, I'm happy to take all the questions and, that you may have. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about my writing, about some of the things that, that go into my writing. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, uh, pretty much my, my writing history over the past 10 years, which is the period of time that I've been writing fiction. And then I'm going to concentrate on The Girl from Berlin, which was originally to be our topic, and uh, talk to you about Eli's promise. And I promise to try very hard not to do any spoilers, so that if you're in the middle of reading Eli's promise or you haven't read it yet, well, I, I won't spoil it for you, I hope. So the questions that I get a lot are when I come to talk about a book. How did you come to write this book? What is it about this book? And, and I will tell you um, before, uh, I will tell you what authors tell, tell me. And when we have our author discussions among ourselves at these events, I will tell you pretty much what an author will tell you. And that is before you can sit down to write a story, even before you commence doing research, which I do for months before I start writing a story because I write historical fiction, um, you have to have uh, certain criteria, certain disciplines in mind. Uh, you have to know the themes that you want to talk about. You have to know where your story is going to go. And you have to know where it ends. You have to know how your story ends because everything you do in your writing process in the book it has to drive toward that end. Um, last fall, I had, I had the honor of speaking to, uh, to the fall meeting of the American, Appellate, American Academy of Appellate Lawyers uh, fall, fall conference. And as with most professional meetings, um, it, the topics for the different sessions were developments in the law, um, uh, improving skills, uh, other practice areas. And I was honest, uh, honored to be chosen by a speaker, especially because there were so many um, uh, very well-known speakers. Here's the bill. You might recognize somebody else who spoke with me. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, it was quite an honor to be there. And, uh, and when, I was, when I was there, we all talked about, and we actually made a, uh, we actually made a PowerPoint of those skills you needed. Because the topic of my panel, which was the opening session, was storytelling. I was there to talk to these appellate lawyers and appellate judges about the skills of storytelling. And 
and we made a, we made a PowerPoint. Um, let's see if I can get this done. There. Um, common disciplines for, for uh, both writing a, a novel and, and writing a good appellate brief because they're pretty much the same if you look at them. And the first thing is what I said a few minutes ago, and that is uh, know your themes, know your ending, where are you going? Everything has to drive in that direction. Uh, if you have some good ideas, but, but they're kind of uh, side roads or speed bumps, you, uh, you're going to uh, lose the interest of the, uh, of the reader. So you don't wanna do that. You wanna set your hook early. That means grab the interest of the reader. So the reader wants to know what's going to happen next. That makes the reader turn the pages. Um, you want to establish your bias early. Who is good and who is bad? Who is right and who is wrong? Uh, and the reader, when they read through the book, will view those facts to reinforce their opinion. Sometimes they'll be wrong. Um, certainly you want to cut and edit. I know when I wrote uh, Eli's Promise, when I finished, there were some 120,000 words. Uh, and I cut it down to, oh, 108. So that's it's a lot of cutting out. And why did I cut it? Not because it, it wasn't well written, I don't think. I cut it because it didn't drive toward the ending. It was, it was just extra. And, and while I thought it was interesting, um, it, it didn't fall within, fall within uh, reaching the end of the story. Now, naturally, when you write uh, historic fiction and you do a lot of research, and that's the same with an appellate brief, but you, you have to be authentic. You can't be careless with the facts. You can't, especially when you write about the Holocaust or you write about World War II, you cannot be careless with the facts. You have to be accurate because if you're not, someone will pick up on it and you'll lose all your credibility. Same thing with an appellate brief. You'll lose your credibility if, if you misstate the law or you misstate facts. So that, uh, those, are, those are the writing guidelines that I tried to pick up on. I didn't start writing until writing fiction until 2010. And, uh, and why was that? Um, I can say life gets in the way. Uh, my wife and I have raised uh, eight children. And, wow. uh, uh, and, uh, and I've been practicing law. And as Allison told you, that uh, uh, it's hard to make room sometimes to, to write a book. But I think that I always wanted to. And uh, why didn't I do it? Well, maybe those things got in the way, but maybe something didn't grab me and say, you want to write? This is something you can get passionate about. Uh, that happened to me in 2010. And that, that because I got a case, an assignment that took me to Poland. When I, uh, now, now the case itself was in, uh, the case itself was in uh, Chicago. Yeah, one company was suing another company over a telecommunications uh, problem. But the case itself took me to Warsaw. It took me to uh, uh, Krakow. It took me to uh, Tarnow. It took me to several locations in Poland. When you go to a place and you're working, it's different from when you're touring. You go on a tour, you're sightseeing, you expect to be moved by, especially in Poland, by what you see. Uh, but when you're working, you're thinking about, I have to take a deposition this afternoon, or I have to meet with a governmental official this afternoon, or uh, this morning we're examining documents in a governmental office. You don't think about the fact that you're walking on a country uh, on, on land that was devastated, totally devastated, uh, where horrible things took place. Except in Poland, you walk around Warsaw, it's in your face. You cannot 
you cannot help but notice. I remember one evening, we were out to dinner in a, in a nice area of Warsaw. We were walking down a street where there are, were, were very nice stores and boutiques. And we walked by this building, uh, a brick building. And in the side of the brick building, there were holes and a plaque that said, here in 1942, the Nazis executed 22 people. And so it just makes you stop what you're doing and realize where you are. So that trip was very emotional for me, uh, the time I spent there. And I, I finally said, well, you know what, if I'm ever gonna write, if I'm ever gonna write a story, um, this is certainly something I can write about. Uh, this is something I can get passionate about. Because writing a story takes you at least a couple of years. And once we were brothers, it took me three years. And I, uh, you're gonna spend that kind of time with a story, you gotta be passionate about it. So I, uh, I started to write that. I wanted to write a story about an ordinary family um, living in an ordinary uh, town, a, a typical town, and what life must have been like for that family uh, during, during the Nazi occupation. I wanted to make it as personal as possible so that the readers themselves could be with that family and see the decisions that they would have to make. I, uh, I chose the town of Samosh, which if you look on this map, you can see it. It's in the far right corner near Lublin. Now, many years ago, that's not what, what uh, Poland looked like. This is what Poland looks like today. Uh, it didn't look like this in 1939. Poland was totally um, conquered and ceased to be. The whole left side of your screen was absorbed into Germany, and the right side of the screen became uh, a, a German property they called the general government. So uh, it didn't look like this. In a few minutes, I'll show you what it looked like uh, back then. But that book became Once We Were Brothers. And I, I have to tell you, <laughs> this was my first book. And in a lot of ways, I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I mean, I knew what I was writing, but I was entering a business, the business of book publishing, and I had no clue. I didn't have an agent. I didn't know anybody in the publishing world. And I didn't, uh, I didn't have a clue how to get my manuscript when I was all done writing it into the bookstores. How do you do that? Uh, you just can't walk into a publishing company. Uh, I'm with Macmillan now. You just can't walk into Macmillan and say, okay, here's the next greatest novel. Uh, put this uh, put this on the shelves. Uh, it doesn't work like that. You have to have an agent. The agent then they're the kind of gatekeepers, literary agents, and then they have to uh, market your book to publishing companies, editors of publishing companies. Um, so I sent chapters of my book and summaries of my book and letters that they call query letters out to agents, and I got rejections from everyone. I, no one wanted my book. Uh, and, and, you know, it's kind of crushing. You send out dozens and dozens of query letters, you get back dozens and dozens of rejections if they bother to send a, a, a correspondence to you at all. And uh, I, a lot of these come back to you on postcards. That's how personal they are. I've spent three years writing a book and I get a postcard rejection. And they all seem to say the same thing. Um, we're not, we're not picking up any new authors at this time, or this is not a project that meets our needs at this time, or uh, this one, which became my favorite. Um, I liked it, but I didn't love it. So I got that a lot. And I came to believe, and I know it's true, but I can't prove it, that there is a stationary store somewhere that sells these pre-printed rejection postcards. And an, and an agent can call up and say, I'm fresh out, send me another stack. So I, <clears throat> but I was intent on having my book published. And uh, I, I, had, uh, I had, my kids are very good technically and they managed to put it into a form where it could be published and printed. And we found a printer, a terrific printer, one of the top printers in the country outside Ann Arbor. And uh, 
I ordered books and I learned something else is you can't order just 50 books or 60 books, um, go away. And so that I had to order a thousand books. And so I did, I ordered a thousand books and um, you might say, well, Ron, what do you think you're doing? Because what are you gonna do with a thousand books? Because you're not a bookstore and you're not a distributor, but I didn't care. So um, you might say to yourself, Ron, how are you gonna get a thousand books from the printing company in Ann Arbor to your house? And that's how you get it there. So one day this big truck comes barreling down my cul-de-sac and uh, unloads a thousand books. Now, hardcover books come in boxes of 16. They're huge. So you, I have the Rocky Mountains of books sitting in my driveway. And it took me all day to get those books from my driveway into my living room. Now, I know that all you ladies out there are saying what my wife said, and that is, don't put those books in your living room. And my wife said that too. Get those books out of my living room. So we, then we moved them into the basement. And, uh, and I sent them out to some friends of mine and um, signed some for a local bookstore. And, and then my kids figured out how to put it online so you could download it for your Kindle and your Nook. And, and then this week we'd sell one book and then maybe another week we'd sell three books. And that's how it went for uh, oh, about six, eight months. And until all of a sudden we sold a thousand books and in the next month, 3,000 books and the next month, 8,000 books, which proves that no matter what you do, books sell by word of mouth. And you have to ask yourself, how did you come to read the last book that you read? And it was because a friend of yours said, I just finished a book, it's terrific, you gotta read it. Or you said to a friend, oh, I finished this book. You looking for a book to read? This is good. So that's, that's how books are sold. And that's how, uh, before I knew it, Once We Were Brothers was up to 125,000 of self-published books. Um, and that's when I got a call from, uh, from St. Martin's uh, at Macmillan. They wanted, they wanted to pick up the book and republish it into a second edition. So that was, that's my history with, with Once We Were Brothers. Now I, I can write a book. Um, people want that book I, and, and my publisher wants me to write another book and I'm only too happy to do it. And at the time I have a son who's with the IDF and he's serving in Israel and he's going into some very dangerous areas. And my wife and I, we, we go to Israel uh, several times a year, way more often than I want to. Uh, and we see where he is and he's in very dangerous places like Hebron. And, uh, and so that prompted me then to write my second book, Saving Sophie, which was about, which really delved on the history uh, between the Israelis and the Palestinians and their dispute. Um, and that's, uh, that, that, uh, that became Saving Sophie. Uh, if you don't know about Saving Sophie, it, it, it's uh, uh, a young American falls in love with a Palestinian girl. Uh, he's Jewish, she's Palestinian, of course, and, and her father forbids the relationship, but uh, being young and in love, they get married, they move to Chicago, they have a daughter named Sophie. Uh, and sadly, the uh, the wife dies and the, the grandfather who is uh, Palestinian, uh, but, but uh, in, in this story, not a very nice man. Uh, he kidnaps Sophie and takes her back to his compound in Hebron. And uh, so the story is about uh, the father's efforts to, to get his daughter back. After saving Sophie, I met a woman, an extraordinary woman named Faye Waldman. This is a picture of Faye Waldman in 1978. It hangs on the wall of the uh, museum, uh, Holocaust Museum here uh, in Chicago. Uh, she was an extraordinary woman. She sought me out. She said, I read Once We Were Brothers and I, I thought I was reading about my own family. You got it just right. Well, when you hear that from a survivor, uh, that's about as best praise as you can get. So I, I asked her if she'd go out to lunch with me and she did. And 
and we went out to lunch and she talked to me about her history, which was so extraordinary. Um, by the way, this picture you're looking at, this was a protest against the Nazis marching in Skokie. I don't know if you remember that, but in 1978, the Nazis, American Nazis, whatever they are, they wanted to march through Skokie because Skokie was a town that had a lot of survivors, very strong Jewish uh, society. And, uh, and then, of course, they, they wanted to come in with their Nazi uniforms and their Nazi flags. Uh, I'm going to sidetrack for a minute. When I'm doing my research for a girl from Berlin, and I'm in Berlin, and I'm talking to Berlin lawyers uh, and, and other people so I can do my research, the lawyer that I'm talking with says to me, you know, here in Germany, if you wear a Nazi uniform, if you wear a swastika a band, if you do a Heil Hitler, uh, if you put SS signa uh, signatures on, on, on anything, if you put a, 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 any kind of Nazi promotional material in your window, you're committing a crime and you go to jail. Uh, we don't permit that at all. And he says, but I see, I see that the Nazis have free reign to do whatever they want in the United States. They can march, they can, uh, uh, they can, they can march through Charlottesville, they can yell, uh, Jews won't defeat us. How, how do you let that happen in America? And I said to him, well, we have freedom of speech. And he says, well, we have freedom of speech in Germany too, but not for that. So I, they made a good point. Anyway, that's a sidetrack. Um, Faye, uh, Faye was leading this, uh, this protest. She grew up in the town of Shanoff in, in, uh, in Poland. And uh, her father was a very well-known man. He was a, a captain in the, uh, the Austria-Hungarian army in World War I, fought side by side with, with the Nazis. And uh, yet when the Nazis came in and uh, occupied Shanoff, uh, they hid uh, Faye up in the attic. Uh, she was a young teen and said, don't come down. And the Nazis arrested her mother, her father, and her brother. She never saw him again. And then uh, she stayed up there in that attic for quite a while. And then finally came down and went out to the farm country and to a farmer that, that her father knew and stayed there for a while. Then she got arrested. She was sent to, a, to work in a slave, slave labor uh, factory. Uh, she, she was sent to uh, Gross Rosen, uh, Gross Rosen uh, concentration camp and worked there. She was arrested. She was sent to Auschwitz and she escaped from the Auschwitz death march. She's an unbelievable woman. But when she told me the part about the two little babies, I said, well, that's it. I got to write this story if you'll let me. And she said she would. And she said she'd even help me write it. But at the time I was writing Saving Sophie and I couldn't do it. And I said to her, when I'm done with Saving Sophie, I'll come back to you and we'll write it together. But God bless her, uh, when I was done with Saving Sophie, her health had slipped and she couldn't help me. And she died soon after. She never saw her book get written. Uh, but that became, uh, that became uh, Carolina's Twins. Um, after Carolina's Twins, I'll do this briefly. I, I wrote a book, I decided to take a break from the Holocaust and World War II. And uh, I wrote it about uh, Northern Ireland uh, and the troubles that that thirty year um, thirty year war between the Catholics and the Protestants that we all saw on TV, but I never understood. And so I, I wrote a mystery where Liam goes back to Northern Ireland where he grew up and uh, tries to solve uh, a series of murders, and that was that that became the trust. All right, now to the girl from Berlin. How did that get written? Well, my son, one of my, one of my, one of my eight, my son wanted to do his um, junior study abroad. Now folks, when I say study, I put those in quotes. Uh, he wanted to study in Florence. I want to study in Florence. I'll bet you want to study in Florence. Anyway, he went for the summer and studied in Florence. And at the end of his period of study, I went there and we did a father-son thing. And we got a car and we drove around Italy. And we drove through Tuscany, 
where there are so many wonderful wineries and we tried to uh, see as many wineries as we could. And I'm proud to say we did well. Um, and they're fabulous. They're fascinating. If you haven't, uh, put that on your bucket list. Uh, they're lovely. They're, they have these lovely chateaus. They have, they have acres and acres of, of rolling uh, hills with, with grapes and olives. And it's, it's just lovely. And then they take you down in the basement and uh, that you get to taste some of their wine, which is not a bad thing. And you think to yourself, this winery must have been in this family for 400 years. And sometimes you'd be right. But more often than not, we heard this winery is owned by a German corporation, which started me to thinking and researching. We know that in 1943, when Italy surrendered and Mussolini was kicked out of office, um, the Germans, the Nazis uh, uh, were uh, immediately invaded Italy and got as far south as uh, Rome. And it was a brutal occupation, brutal. Uh, so many people were killed. They were, their instructions were to round up every single uh, Jew and send them north uh, to the concentration camps. And there were, nice, there were very nice old Jewish societies there. There weren't a lot of Jews in Italy, or maybe 50,000, but, but there were old Jewish communities in Siena and in Rome. And, and, uh, and that, so the, 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 the occupation w was brutal. Anyway, at the end of the war, they're supposed to give all the property they seized back but they didn't always do that. And, uh, and that's been a problem even for the past 70 years because uh, in the 1990s, there was, a, there was a, a declaration signed by 47 countries that said, if you can prove that property was taken by the Nazis or through the Nazis, you're entitled to, to get your money back uh, or your property back. And uh, if the people are no longer uh, and you could prove that that property was taken and the, and the original owners aren't there anymore, uh, then that property has to be declared airless and sold and the money given to survivor organizations. That's still, still an issue. Um, in any event, that's why uh, I had the uh, girl from Berlin uh, starts in, in uh, Tuscany. Uh, it appears that uh, Aunt Gabby has a farm uh, in Pienza I uh, can't tell you how lovely Pienza is. And uh, it's about to be taken over uh, by a large Italian wine corporation that says they have better title to the land than she does. Um, fortunate for her, she has a nephew in Chicago. Fortunate for anyone who has a nephew in Chicago. But she, her nephew in Chicago is friends with uh, Catherine and Liam. And uh, asks Catherine and Liam if they wouldn't go to Italy and help his aunt save her property. Um, after some discussions uh, and the idea of going to, uh, to, to Tuscany, um, they decide to go. But before they leave, they're given a manuscript and the manuscript was written a long time ago by a woman named Ada Baumgarten. Ada Baumgarten is the girl from Berlin. The manuscript traces her life during that period of time. We don't know at that moment why that manuscript's important, but it will come out uh, ultimately that the manuscript was given to Catherine and Liam to help them in solving uh, Gabby's land uh, problem. Ada is a young girl growing up in Berlin um, before Nazification, before 1933. This, by the way, uh, Ada could be any one of these little girls. Uh, this, by the way, is uh, taken from the uh, Jewish Girls School, uh, which is in Berlin, uh, uh, Oranienberger Strasse. Uh, it's not a girls' school anymore, but, but it's open to the public, and you can see, and they have a lot of pictures and, and uh, uh, a lot of things to look at. Um, Ada uh, is a, a wonderful child. She's a brilliant child. Her father is a concertmaster, first violinist for the Berlin Philharmonic Orchestra. Uh, and he 
teaches her to play the violin and she is gifted and she becomes a wonderful violinist and all she wants to do is grow up and sit next to her father in the Berlin Philharmonic and play music, which she is good enough to do. But I want you to look at this picture and I want you to count how many women are there in the orchestra. Count them all. There are none. There are no women in this orchestra in the 1930s. There are no women in this orchestra in the 40s, 50s, or 60s. In fact, there are no women in any major orchestra during that period of time anywhere in the world. People ask me sometimes, in your research, do you find things that astound you? That astounds me. That I go now to the, to the Chicago Symphony, and there are probably more women than men in that orchestra. They're wonderful. And it astounded me that, that at the time that this picture is taken, which was in the 30s, there are no women in this orchestra or in Boston, New York, uh, Paris, London, not any major orchestra in the world. Anyway, Ada is growing up. Um, and, and this is one of the themes that I wanted to develop in writing this story. Uh, that is, what happened to professionals, to musicians, and especially Jewish musicians? Nothing. No, I'm watching this from the thing, Ronald Wilson. I'm sorry? All right. What happens to Jewish okay. musicians? You did. When, uh, yeah, I just want to. When, when the country went from that Weimar Republic mute, to Nazification. Um, unmute or mute? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, somebody's you. unmuted. I don't know why they're, how they're unmuted, but whoever it is, please mute yourself. Go ahead, Ron. All right. In any event, um, that, that's, that's, that's one of the themes I wanted to explore in this book is what happened to these professionals um, when they were from that pre-Nazi period of time. Uh, they called the, the Weimar culture, that big explosion of culture that they had in Berlin with the music and you hear me? Okay. Um, so that, that, that's one of the things I, that I was after. Um, obviously, Ada is growing up and she's excelling with the junior orchestra, but times are changing for her. And she, uh, uh, obviously the Nazis are taking over, the racial laws are in effect, um, and, and Jews are losing their professional licenses, uh, especially uh, in, in the arts, except the Berlin Philharmonic, because Wilhelm Furtwangler, the, uh, the uh, the head of the orchestra and, and the orchestra's director and conductor, he protects his Jews. He, kept, he, he got a lot, at Nuremberg, he got a lot of flack because he continued to conduct his orchestra and it was uh, Hitler's pride and joy. And he continued, he stayed there throughout the war and did that. But that's really unfair. He was there for his music and he protected his Jews. His Jews were, were, were never uh, uh, arrested and persecuted. Uh, ultimately, at the end of the war, they all left, but they left on their own. Um, he, he protected his Jewish players, and he continued to play Jewish composers and have Jewish guest artists. But anyway, um, Ada's family obviously realizes that, that her career isn't going anywhere in, in in uh, Berlin during this period of time. So they make arrangements for her to go to Bologna uh, and, and play with the uh, Bologna State Opera Company uh, on, on a, a, someone's on sabbatical leave. Um, that's another theme I wanted to develop. And that is uh, Jews in Italy during the war, uh, what happened to Jewish families and what happened to Jewish professionals because Italy was different. Italy really had three different phases of, of what happened to Jews. Um, Italy is, was not an anti-Semitic state. 
Mussolini was not anti-Semitic. He had a Jewish mistress. And, um, but when he chummed up with Hitler, he decides to put in racial laws. And Jewish children were prohibited from going to school. But still, Italian society itself uh, did, not, did not condemn Jews like, like in Italy. So when the war, during the war time that, that Italy was in the war, 40 to 43, things did get uh, uh, difficult for Jewish families, and, uh, but, but not to the extent in, in Germany. But then after 1943, when the Nazis uh, occupied the country, uh, then of course it was terrible. And, uh, and many Jews were killed and many Jews were sent uh, north to uh, concentration camps. So those were the stories that, that I wanted to tell. Um, uh, Ada, um, what happened to her and her family and her parents uh, during that war and, uh, and how then that affects Gabby's farm at the end uh, of the book. There, there, is, there is a solution to how uh, Gabby saves her farm and it does come from Ada's book. This, by the way, when I was uh, in, in Berlin, this is another thing that astounds me. Uh, the Berlin Philharmonie is where the Berlin Philharmonic plays now, it's a beautiful new building. Uh, the original building, of course, was a classic and was bombed in the war. But this is, this is what stands right out front of the Berlin Philharmonie. And isn't that ironic? Huh? It's a woman violinist, uh, the, uh, a symbol of the Berlin Philharmonie, when no women could be members at all uh, back, back in that time. All right. Now we move on to Eli's promise. How are we doing on time? We're good. Okay. We're good, Ron. All right, good. I don't want to run out too long. Um, Eli's promise was different for me. Um, Eli's promise uh, as a departure. For one thing, um, Catherine and Liam are not in the book. Now, and I've been catching a lot of flack about that too on social media. Where's Catherine and Liam? We like them. Yes. Uh, I can only say uh, they're coming back. They'll be, they'll be back next year in, uh, uh, in a book I'm working on now, which is just about finished. And that'll be out next fall uh, called Defending Britta Stein. Catherine and Liam will, will be back. Um, Anyway, uh, the other thing that, that made this book different is because uh, it, it goes over three time periods, three eras, um, wartime Lublin, uh, post-war uh, displaced persons camp, and then um, America uh, in, in the 60s, uh, and specifically the Albany Park section of Chicago. Uh, so, and, and it, and it I hoped by that to develop uh, a, a close and personal, maybe emotional tie to what happened to a family in Lublin afterwards. And then and, and what, what ultimately was a, a Jewish migration from the Polish cities to the displaced persons camp to land in, in places uh, ultimately in America or, or Israel uh, but many times in America and places like Brooklyn and Philly and, and Albany Park, uh, Chicago. So that, that, uh, that was my goal in writing Eli's Promise. Uh, Eli's Promise starts off, uh, the, the very beginning of it, with the liberation of uh, Buchenwald by the U.S. Third Army, uh, the 6th Division Super 6. I want you to look at this picture. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not spoiling anything. This happens right in the beginning, folks. Um, Look at this picture. Do you see what it is? They're children. This is the children that are being liberated. There were a thousand children in Buchenwald when it was liberated. Um, and, and of course, we know the stories uh, uh, in the Buchenwald, in the Buchenwald uh, subcamp of Ordruf. That was where Eisenhower and Patton viewed, uh, uh, viewed the prisoners for the first time. And uh, Patton couldn't even go in. Uh, to see them, he was 
it, it affected him so badly and he went to town and he dragged the whole town out there to, 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 to see for themselves what was going on. Anyway, <clears throat> so it begins with the loop, uh, liberation of Buchenwald um, and in, in the camp is Eli and his son Isaac, uh, both of them in the camp. It then goes to the, uh, for a moment, to the displaced persons camp, uh, the Farnwald camp in, uh, in southern Germany, near Munich. Um, and, and we see that Eli and Itzhak are there now, they're healthy, but they're there in the displaced persons camp. And he reflects on what life was like uh, back when he was in Lublin. Lublin is a fascinating story. Now this is a map of Poland from 1939, before Poland was carved up and restructured. Lublin was in the middle of the, uh, of the country. It is now over to the right side in, in, in a different, it's a, uh, Poland is different. But uh, Lublin had 46,000 Jews. Um, and it was, and it, it, you see, it's the center of the country. It was also the center of Judaism. It was the center of Jewish Jewish learning. Uh, in Lublin was this yeshiva called Yeshiva Kachme Lublin, uh, which is yeshiva of the wise men, uh, uh, the premier learning spot for Judaism. You had to memorize 400 pages of Talmud to even apply to get in there. Uh, and it is also the repository for uh, 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 priceless Jewish writings, uh, which made this uh, a, uh, a focus, uh, a target for the Nazis, uh, Lublin. Uh, at, at the end of the war, of 46,000, there were only 200 left. And it made it, it, made it a target for, for them, and especially the yeshiva. Uh, they came into... Uh, to Lublin and uh, immediately occupied the yeshiva. Uh, they uh, made it into a police station for the order police and uh, they uh, burned all of the writings in a big bonfire in the street. Um, we find that Eli and, and his son Isaac and his wife, Esther, lived in Lublin. Eli is a good man. He's a solid citizen. He owns a construction company with his father and his brother. Uh, and, and I'm, well, it is my hope as you read this, that you put yourself in the shoes of Eli. And as he faces each of these events that happen, he has to make a decision. And you put yourself in his shoes and, and do you make that decision? Do you dare make that decision? Eli's wife says, we can't stay here, we have to go. Let's go, we'll go out to the country, we'll get a house. But he turns that down, he stays there. Uh, and then we find out that there is an evil profiteer, a man who manages to cozy up to the Nazis uh, and thereby gain a lot of influence. He supplies them with liquor, he supplies them with money, he supplies them with girls. He he is an evil man, and he is a, a war profiteer. And that is one of an overriding theme in this book that we see in every era, there are war profiteers, people who will, uh, who, will who will gain or seek to gain at, at the expense of, of people who are uh, desperate. Um, Lublin is... Uh, was immediately uh, forced to, uh, uh, many of the people forced to leave their homes and they are, they are put into a ghetto. Lublin actually had two ghettos, had a ghetto A and a ghetto B. Uh, ghetto A was the old tar part of town where their, uh, people were stuffed in there. Uh, all the people and, and people brought from other Polish cities were brought there uh, and there really wasn't very much uh, room for them. There was really no place for them to live. Um, but they, uh, but that, that, and then ghetto B was uh, for more or less 
uh, the, uh, people who were essential, doing essential things. Um, and Eli was one of those people. He managed to uh, to uh, his 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 construction yard was essential, and the Nazis needed it, even though they gave it over to to this profiteer. Uh, and the Eli makes a deal with the profiteer. He will manage the brick the uh, brickyard, the construction company, for the profiteer if the profiteer will protect his wife and son. Does that happen? Well, you, you have to read and find out. Anyway, that's the Lublin ghetto. Um, remember I told you the Nazi order police um, took over the yeshiva uh, and they sought to, uh, to grab, as, round up as many Jews as they could and send them to camps and uh, slave labor sites. And if, if they were hiding, then the order police went on a Jew hunt. And this is actually a picture of, of the order police on a Jew hunt, if you can believe it. Um, this is the Maidana camp. Uh, Lublin, in addition to being the center of, of Jewish learning and all before the war, was also uh, the center of a number of death camps. Uh, they made that the center in the Lublin district. So it was uh, Belgec and and uh, Sobibor and Kelmno and Maidanek, these, uh, these terrible death camps. This was the Maidanek camp. That is the smokestack, which could be seen from the Lublin ghetto and, and, and the odor too could be smelled. So that's the first part takes place in Lublin. We find that in 1945, after the war, Eli and Itzhak are in the uh, foreign involved uh, displaced persons camp. There are 250,000 Jews that are displaced and they're, uh, they're in camps. But actually there are a million people that are displaced after the war. But the 250 Jew, Jews, the uh, share at Hapleta, the surviving remnants, they, they are in camps. Most of them gravitate toward the US camps, uh, foreign involved being one of them if you can see it, it's if you look down to Austria, it's just to the left of Austria there, the Farnwald camp um, near near Munich. Um, I wanted to tell the story about what happened to people and how they got their lives back together or tried to get their lives back together in these displaced persons camps. And uh, they were platforms, they were staging areas. People were given uh, training. Uh, to try to, to get them back into society. But, but you look at it and at the, here are people who suffered so badly, um, these survivors, they suffered so badly in camps. Uh, now they were liberated and yet they're in another camp. And all they wanna do is be liberated from camps and move on with their lives, but they can't do it because there's places they wanna go won't let them in. And they, they uh, the visas, the quotas are terrible. Uh, they're restricted for uh, Central European refugees, for Jews especially, but they're not so restricted if you're trying to get in from Scandinavian countries or from, uh, or from the British Isles. Anyway, uh, in this story, there's a profiteer who manages to be selling visas uh, to... Uh, for a very high price, if you can get them together. Um, third part of the, of the story takes place in Albany Park. And uh, Albany Park is, uh, after the war, was a, a center for refugees. It was um, uh, Polish, Russian, uh, European refugees. Uh, they say if you stand on the corner of Lawrence and Kedzie you'd hear four, seven different languages. And it, it, it's, it's not so much like that anymore. Um, it, people have moved on, there are different ethnic groups there now, but um, this was a migration stop for, uh, for Jewish refugees. Um, Albany Park has these old, uh, what they call Chicago bungalow houses, uh, buildings, two and three flats. 
Um, I chose this period of time um, because it was a time for war profiteers. Uh, this time war profiteers uh, were military contractors and kickback people trying to make money off of the buildup in men and materials to fight the war in Vietnam. Um, Rolling Thunder was, was, was part of this area in 1965. And, uh, and, and believe me, uh, here's war profiteers making money off of, uh, off of uh, uh, more tragedies. In fact, there, there, uh, a good argument can be made that, that the Vietnam operations like Rolling Thunder occurred because of the uh, wealth available uh, for military purchases of equipment. And uh, so um, these, uh, these were the hearings that were going on at that time. It was very common um, uh, bribery and kickback cases. And so that, that became a part also. Uh, we find that Eli is now in Albany Park working for the government and working to uh, solve some of these kickback cases. So that, that is Eli's promise. Um, Eli is a, a, a good portion of it. Uh, uh, Eli is trying to hold his family together uh, and holding them together in, uh, in Lublin, trying to hold them together in, in the displaced person camp. And uh, ultimately, um, what happens to him and his wife and, and his son. So, uh, which brings me to the end of my talk. So that's, uh, I guess we get to the, the Q&A part now. The Q&A part, thank you so much, Ron. It, it was so interesting to hear sort of the evolution of your writing and of the different novels that you wrote. And I was glad you brought up Kate and Liam because I was gonna ask you, how come you didn't put Kate and Liam in the book? Although I loved Eli's promise, I missed them. <laughs> but they weren't old enough. See, it was over in 1965. They weren't born yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. I hadn't thought about that. All thought right. Of, Very I good. Like to. They're good you, friends of mine. You did, you did answer a number of questions that we had already received. If people please put questions in the chat. Um, Susan Seferis is going to be watching the chat for me to see if there are more questions. Let me start with um, a book, a question that came up from several people, um, Barry Shapiro, Rabbi Ellen Wallens Field. Do you expect any of your books will be made into movies? Once Where Our Brothers was sold to a movie company a long time ago, uh, maybe four years ago, five years ago. I, I don't know. Um, okay. It'd be nice, but but uh, who, who knows? And and I assume you've been writing during COVID. You said you have another book coming out. That's right. Defending Britta Stein. This okay. one, I love this book. This is about Denmark. Denmark is a wonderful story. The whole country <laughs> was righteous. I mean, uh, it's, it's an incredible story. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that one. Um, the character Adina in Eli's Promise, someone would like to know, is Adina going to become a recurring character going forward? She's a very strong character and she's a very strong woman, which a lot of us appreciate. <laughs> I like, well, I'm glad to, I like to hear that. Um, I think she's a strong woman as well. And I, I don't think that she's out for anything uh, but, but honesty and goodness. And, and, uh, but she's not in, the, in, in defending Britta Stein. So oh. Whether she ever appears again, I don't know. But There are a couple of questions that center around the issue of Ada Baumgarten. And um, someone asked, whether or not you were a trained, you yourself are a trained musician. And I see what looks like a guitar case back there. And how did you get all of the wonderful details about concerts, operas, violin training, etc.? I dedicated the book to Sarah Teitelbaum, my grandmother. 
she was a concert pianist. She played with the Detroit Symphony. Uh, she was a piano teacher all her life. I remember going up to her house. And she had two Steinway grands in her living room. Two. She would play with her students. And uh, she always had an opera playing. And that's where I learned to love opera. Uh, you see opera come up in a lot of my books. And she, she passed that along to me. So I think my love of music comes from my, uh, from my grandmother. Okay. Um, so what, I know that your love of music came from your grandmother, but did you need to do a lot of research about learning to play the violin and how oh, orchestras work and all of that? Absolutely, absolutely. I, I don't know anything about the violin or didn't, uh, but I, I took some master classes in violin on YouTube. Uh, you can actually take a master class from Yasha Heifetz. And uh, yeah, you, there's so much you can access now. Uh, it's ridiculous. I do, have, I do have a friend who is a violinist, but um, I didn't want to get too technical, but it's, um, I know that the Boston Symphony string department have all read the book because I know, I know a violinist there. Okay. Another question has to do with um, a technique in your writing. How did you decide in both books when it's the right time to jump from the past into the present and vice versa? This person found it a very effective technique in both books to help keep her interest. I, I, I don't know how to answer that. It, it, is, it is a hard thing to do and, and um, and I don't ever want people to be confused. So it has to be the right time. And, and in Eli's promise, um, you always know where you are because it, it, every chapter has a heading. And it says you're in a foreign wall camp, you're in Lubla. It's 1943, it's 1941. It always says where you are. But I think that, <clears throat> I don't know, it's a matter of feel that you get to a certain point in the narrative, and then you can make a jump. You can go back, you know, or you can go forward. Uh, just as long as it, it doesn't confuse people. Hi. Another question, really more about today. There's a resurgence of right-wing politics in Europe during any trips that you have taken to Poland or other locations in Europe for research on the Holocaust. Did you see personally evidence of a dangerous growth of anti-Semitism? You know, I, I get that question a lot, obviously. <clears throat> and, the, and the time that I lived and worked in Poland, uh, I did not see any of it, not any of it. Uh, my trip to Berlin, I don't know. If you go to Berlin now, uh, from what I can see, facially, I don't know anybody in Berlin and I don't know Berlin society. But facially, what you can see in Berlin is, Berlin is very accepting and, and responsible and uh, for what happened. Uh, there are wonderful Jewish museums, uh, statues, uh, goodness, there are all sorts of uh, homages being paid to the Jewish community uh, in Berlin. I was very impressed by it all. Okay. Um... Someone asked about the phrase, make Germany great, and whether you were repeating something that was said during Hitler's era or whether that's a phrase that you made up. And I confess, I was going back in my mind to the um, Auschwitz exhibit in New York and trying to remember, did I see that on a poster? But maybe you can answer that question. Well, he didn't speak English, but to paraphrase him, he did say that. He okay. did to make Germany great again. Okay. He didn't wear a MAGA hat, but uh, he did say that. We're not talking politics tonight, Ron. <laughs> no, no, no. No, but I mean, it, he did say that. I mean, that was just, he, he did preach that. He preached the economy, full employment, all of that. Right. Okay. Um, 
There are a couple of questions about Maximilian, about Max, the profiteer, the war profiteer, and the selling of papers to get to the United States. Mm -hmm. One person asked, um, was his character based on a specific person that you found in your research? And another person wanted to know why you didn't um, give him some redeeming qualities instead of making him purely evil. <laughs> um, well, I don't, I don't know. I don't think he was deserving of redeeming qualities. But uh, no, he's not based on a specific individual. Okay. There were cases of fraud in uh, granting people uh, entrance into the United States, putting them higher on the list, uh, passing other people, uh, passing, I mean, that people got in here that, that shouldn't have got in here. Uh, privileges were given to people who, who, had, who had served in certain areas. Uh, privileges were given to um, Nazis, Ger Germans, who the America thought might be helpful. Uh, right. Yeah. So I, no, I, I, uh, I don't. Not not a specific person. Okay. Um, you you already partially answered some of this question. Um, this comes from Neil Weitz and Corn. Um, you mentioned that you did travel to some of the sites mentioned in Eli's Promise. And you mentioned um, that many of the wineries were owned by Germans. But um, to sort of extrapolate on Neil's question, was there an actual happening like what happened with Gabby's property? Or was that um, purely made up in your own head? You know, the, the fight for hanging on to her, her vineyards and her farm. Well, Gabby and her farm, it's fictional. Um, not based on a specific person. But, but, um, but the fact that uh, farms were seized no question about it, especially if they belong to Jews. But, but property was seized. Property was seized from Italians. Property was seized uh, by the Germans. And, and I, I, I can't tell you what percentage ha has not been returned or, or okay. relinquished. I can't tell you that. But it's still an issue. Uh, it's still an issue today. And... Uh, something I wanted to develop, I think. But it's still an issue. I met a woman who, pursuant to that Terezin Declaration that I was talking about, where all these 47 countries said that they would uh, honor the fact and, and act in, as a, an official policy that if you could prove Nazis uh, took, took the property from you, you, you would deserve to either get it back or be uh, recompensed for it. And I met a woman whose father owned a building in central Berlin, a furrier building, he was a furrier. And just a few years ago, she, uh, she got it back. Uh, she didn't get the building back, but she got uh, essential, uh, essentially what it would have been worth. Okay. Um, going back to Eli's promise, someone asks this question. The character of Eli seems extremely personal to you. Um, and when you spoke about him, that he was really a good man, that sounded very personal. Was he based on someone that you actually know? No. no. You know, the wonderful thing about writing historical fiction is that the story of the background has already been written for me. It exists. It's there. Uh, I can research it. I can find out details about it, which make us, which give the story fabric. But um, all I have to do is create characters and a plot to weave into that, 
to weave into that, that, that historical background. Um, no, I, I don't. Eli wasn't based on a specific person, but I tried to make him somebody, somebody that we could all relate to. Uh, a good man who tries to hold his family together, who is faced with so many difficult decisions to make. Um, do you leave? Do you stay? Do you leave your wife and go to to uh, to Wooch to 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 start a new business when 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 you're almost forced to? Um, do you do you continue to rely on somebody who you know to be a scoundrel? Um, I, I, you know, that I, I try to, you know, to make it so that it, you put yourself in his shoes so you can identify with that character. You put yourself in his shoes. Do you second guess his decisions or do you say, well, I don't know, what's his choice, you know? Mm -hmm. I think someone else was asking um, that in both books, there were a lot of difficult decisions. Um, you know, decisions to leave a family, to go back to Kieranstadt and have the family go on, who got on the train, you know, who didn't get on the train, that kind of thing. Yeah. So making difficult decisions is kind of a theme in your books in many cases. Um, so I'd like to go now, um, I'll take a look at the chat. Those were questions that were given to us before. Let me see what we have in the chat. Whoops, I can't get my chat open. I, I have it, Allison. You okay, go ahead, Stu. Uh, yeah. Okay, the first, the first question in the chat. Uh, who is responsible for the title of The Girl from Berlin? I felt the title should have, re have a reference to the violinist or musicianship of the main character. I love the book. I worried as I read it. So I guess where did the title come from is the question. That is the hardest thing to do when you write a book is to make a good title. And I, I struggle with that all the time. Um, Once We Were Brothers turned out to be a really good title. I, uh, I wasn't crazy about the title, The Trust. I thought it should be called something else, but I gave in. Um, the Girl from Berlin was actually a suggestion by one of the editors at, uh, at St. Martin's. Um, and it seemed to fit okay. I was okay with that. Okay, thank you. There, there's another question here uh, about Carolina's twins. You mentioned there's they were real. There were real life twins. Were they saved the same way? Phrased in case someone hasn't read the book. So were they saved the same way? The real life. It's hard, it's hard to. Uh, it's it, it's hard not to give give away something that's very important. But I, um, let me just say this. The twins were real. Okay. They were real. And what happened to those twins was real. That, I didn't make that up. Okay. Does it matter what order you read your books in? No. No. They're okay. standalone books. I mean, if, if you follow it from once we were brothers out through, I suppose, uh, you, you you get used to Catherine and Liam and some of their idiosyncrasies, but yeah. I don't think so. I think you can read them in any order. They're standalone. Okay. Somebody wrote a wonderful presentation. So interesting. Thank you to Ron Balson and to everyone who organized the chat. Love the girl from Berlin. Thank you for another interesting talk. And there's another question here. Uh, oh, thank you for writing about Zamosk. Zamosk. We learned so much about the city of our father's birth. We never asked him about Zamosk because we didn't want to make him sad. Uh, here's another question. Many successful authors were teamed as attorneys. Do you have any league with them? In other words, are you involved with any other attorneys that write books? Well, I, 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 I've met Scott Turo. I've been with him on a couple of occasions. And I've... Uh, I've also, uh, I, when, I, when I did this panel at the American Academy of Appellate Lawyers, I was on a panel um, with uh, a, a judge who is also a writer. He writes fiction as well. Matter of fact, he has written books with uh, Patterson. Uh, he writes crime books. So um, yeah, I, I, 
and, and I'm, I'm frequently at events where there are where there are a number of other lawyers, especially at conferences. I, goodness, we had a conference down in uh, Fort Lauderdale last year. There were a lot of lawyers, judge, uh, a lot of writers down there. Um, Pam Jenoff was there. She's a friend of mine. Um, there were there were a lot of authors down there. Okay, I just see a couple more questions here. Um, Tara, can you scroll back up here. Uh, I know we're running very short on time. People are starting to leave. Uh, do you consider using different character voices to tell your stories? I don't know. If, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Do you consider using more of your more of your characters' own voices to tell the stories rather than a narrator? They clarified the question later. Oh, for, oh no, I don't really have much to do with that. Um, they have chosen uh, uh, Fred Berman, who people love it. So I mean, I me, I don't like to listen. To uh, to anybody read my books because I those voices are in my head. I know what they sound like because I made them. And uh, so when somebody else reads them and has a different inflection or says it uh, in a different manner than I think it would have been, so it, it kind of disturbs me. So I don't really listen to my book on audio. But everyone raves about Fred Berman and loves what he does. So. Who's to argue with success? Exactly. Okay. I think we've covered almost all, pretty much all the questions. The other questions I have you answered during your talk, Ron. I cannot thank you enough for taking you through, taking us through a little bit about all of your books. And I am a loyal reader. I can't wait for Defending Britta Stein to come out. When is it coming out? I would think next September. Good. A date has been set yet, but. Okay, so we're gonna try again, Ron. We're gonna try to do the next one in person. <laughs> okay. Yeah, if it's not better by next year, oh my goodness. Exactly. Rabbi, would you like to say anything at the end before we close? I just wanna thank everybody for, uh, for coming on. Thank you, Ron, for really a, a comprehensive walk through everything. Uh, thank you, Allison and Sue, the committee co-hosts, um, everybody from participating from near and far. Uh, look forward to, to more. I think we're all going to be in Zoom land for a while still. Um, well, we, have, we do have some people who've come, in addition to New York City, we have people on the chat who came from Boynton Beach, from Plano, Texas, from Shelter Rock, locally from Edison, from Toronto, from Synagogue Beth David. And I want to thank again both Change and the Women's League for Conservative Judaism who have not only helped us to promote this event, but have really become our loyal supporters as we do our Meet the Author programs. I, I'm so delighted that everyone is enjoying the program so much. And I know the entire committee joins me in thanking all of you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me. Thank you, Ron. And one last thing for anyone who wants a book plate signed by Ron, Neil Weitzenkorn, would you put your email again into the chat? You can send your name and your address to Neil and we will arrange to have Ron sign the book plates. Thank you again, Ron, and good night, everyone. We'll leave, we'll leave the Zoom up for a little while so that you can put your name and address in, in the chat. Well, or so you can read Neil's email, okay? Allison, um, some people asked when they, where they can see the recording you want to announce the name? Of, it's going to be on the website, right? The, tonight, um, and Rabbi, you, you may want to stop the recording. I don't know how to do that. Um, but we are recording tonight's event. It's going to be going to the same person who helped us prepare for the High Holy Days, um, Shane Squarick, who's going to edit it for us.